thank you again for being here and spending some time with the CRE Project Podcast and our listeners. Um, just so our listeners know, I, I found you on another podcast and enjoyed your information so much. I ended up buying some of your uh, educational content and connected with you on LinkedIn. And uh, one thing led to another, and here we are. So raising capital, syndication, and uh, real estate development is a passion of mine and of Clayton's. And you work in that world every day. Um, we wanted to share some of that information with our listeners so they can get a better idea of uh, their next best steps when they're wanting to raise capital for real estate. So uh, with that being said, would you mind sharing with our listeners a little bit about you, your background, and how you ended up in this arena? Sure, Gannon. First of all, thank you on two counts. One, thank you very much for listening to any podcast that I'm on. And secondly, for buying my stuff. I really appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. And we can certainly yeah. talk about how you can supercharge. I know you, I don't want to be indiscreet. You can share with your listeners what you bought, but uh, I'm happy to talk about how you can supercharge that. Uh, if you like, we can talk about that a little bit today. Absolutely. Uh, my, my background actually is as a sponsor, both on, well, the beginning of my career, actually the very beginning of my career, I was pulling wires for an electrician. That's actually how I started. I got with my hands dirty. Uh, and then I migrated to raising money from overseas investors during the 1980s. And then there was a downturn, savings and loan downturn. I ended up being hired by Universal Studios to run Asia Pacific region real estate development for them as president of that division. Based in Tokyo, I came back and uh, started working on my own deals. And then in 2007, sold everything. <laughs> Basically, I got out. Yeah. And uh, I actually ended up working for major institutions. I was brought in through the board of directors to uh, a major bank in, here in California, and then ultimately to uh, Colony Capital, who are one of the biggest private equity real estate funds in the world. And my job was to look at, uh, was to divest of their portfolios of distressed real estate. Actually, it was distressed, it was actually non performing loans collateralized by real estate, to be precise. So this was the second time, and you asked me before we started you know, was I still developing? But this was the second time I'd actually been through a very major downturn. The first one was in, two, was in 1989, 1990, when I lost everything. I was in my mid-20s, I'd made millions, but it was all on paper and it all went up in smoke. And then during the last downturn, at the, I just was exposed to so many deals. It was like, uh, I don't know, I was in the OR, uh, is that right? The ER, the ER, I should say, the ER for uh, uh, for real estate, and just saw all these distressed deals. And it, I'm very conservative by nature, and so I had stopped developing because I sold everything in '07, and I haven't got back into it primarily because I've been really just very concerned. <laughs> to be honest with you, just I saw so much devastation. So what I decided to do instead, and this, it's a bit circuitous, but I decided like the old story of the 49ers, right? The guys that mined for gold. There were yep. some that did and there were a lot that didn't, but the ones that made the shovels always won. So yep. I decided I'd make the shovels. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to tell you how I got into it, but I migrated into digital marketing to help sponsors to raise money because it occurred to me using the internet to raise money was game changing from the way that I'd done it. And I've raised over half a billion in my career of equity. So wow. that's what I decided. Uh, that's what I decided to do about five years ago. Fantastic. And, and I, I got a quick question. Uh, <clears throat> what, when you sold in 07, not, not, not to digress, but I, I really have to ask, was it just coincidental or did you guys see trends or... What, tell us a little bit about that before we move on to the digital market. Sure. I would love to tell you that I had run my algorithms and <laughs> predicted it, but I didn't. The algorithm that I was going through at the time was entirely in my gut. Really? All right. Some, 
There was something going on. I was raising money for several deals. Uh, Banks, actually. I'd already raised the equity and we were out now um, uh, raising debt. There was one in particular. It was the largest what's called small lot subdivision in uh, inner city area in, uh, in L.A. And I remember that there was something strange going on with the banks. I, I, I couldn't tell you what. I, people were disappearing from banks. They stopped responding. The subprime loans were starting to cause problems. And it started to migrate to the uh, alt A's, what we we'll call the alt A's, this other kind of loans. And at the same time, there were strange noises coming out of banks. And I just, guys, seriously, I was waking up in the middle of the night kind of with a discomfort. Mm-hmm. I, I just wasn't comfortable. And I just thought, you know, I want out. I want out. This is something wrong. And so I contacted everybody. <laughs> Here's how I did it, by the way. I contacted everybody who had developments nearby me who were competing with me. And I asked them if they wanted to partner with me with uh, construction and development and overhead, et cetera. And they, they all asked if they could buy me out. And so reluctantly, <laughs> I agreed to. <laughs> wow. That's actually That's how great. I got That's a great strategy. Well, yeah. Th- thanks for giving us some background on that. And we're sure. Super excited to, to obviously have you have you on and learn more about you know this new venture that that you're in and it was it was funny because I was Gannon and I were talking before the show here um, and we were just talking about kind of this new era of how to raise capital you know and uh, we feel like you know you along with a select few others are are really kind of on the the leading edge or the bleeding edge possibly of, of this whole movement, but this is really where kind of the, the future is going or even the current, you know, and you can obviously educate the, us on that. But, you know, I think what, what we'd really like to, to hear from you today, and I'll, I'll have Gannon add on to this when, when I'm done talking here, but, um, you know, when it comes to traditional real estate syndication or partnerships, right, everyone's used to getting a group of local high net worth, individuals together, doctors, attorneys, et cetera, that need to place some money um, and you put together a small fund and you go and do a real estate deal. Um, you know, and it sounds like the more and more that we progress in this digital marketing era, um, you know, we're finding out and educating ourselves that that's really a limited path to take when you're trying to raise capital for a real estate project. You know, our, our biggest question and what we'd like to, to learn from you today is A, you know, what are the most effective methods to raising capital? But B, you know, I told Gannon, I'm, I'm in the real estate business, you know, actively, and I'm doing deals actively as is Gannon. And I even have some hesitancy towards investing with somebody online. You know, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm going to have a big, big issue or I guess resistance internally. Hey, I've never met you know, a certain individual and, you know, now I'm going to give them a hundred thousand dollars X. So I'm being very blunt and direct with you because I want, I want to be, and I want to see how you guys overcome that obstacle and obviously gain credibility and trust through the digital age, which I think people are becoming more comfortable with, but I, I would love to learn more about that. And I think our listeners are just going to learn a ton. And this could be just such a, uh, just a, such a powerful tool to help them catapult into the next, uh, you know, form of their career. So again, I don't know if you want to add on to that or not. No, but. I think you nailed it. How do you establish trust and credibility with folks you don't know? You know. So let me uh, address. Uh, let me address a couple things. I'm just taking some notes so that I don't forget. Here we go. Uh, one more word that I remember now. So the first thing is, um, so three points to answer your question. The first is you said you're not sure what the most effective means is to raising capital. And I'm going to say this in all sincerity. The most effective way to raise capital is to bring good deals to the table, period. Amen. Nothing else that you do changes that underlying fact, right? It, 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 you, I could build for you, you could build your own, 
state-of-the-art digital marketing, content marketing, investor acquisition system, and you will raise not dollar one unless you have good deals. Yeah. So everything is based on that period, right? So if you've not got good deals, don't bother trying to raise money, right? No matter how you try. And with That's that really, being, what's that? What is a good deal these days? For what, what you have seen, are people are looking, you know, I think expectations have um, gone down a little bit on the returns. You're not looking at, I mean, unless you've got a really sweet deal sponsor and really great deals, the high teen, the low 20 IRR deals just aren't as prevalent. And maybe in the next 12 to 24 months, those will start circulating again. What, do you, what is a good deal in your eyes? I completely disagree with you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we've just met. That's great. Here's, here's the deal. <clears throat> you have to go through, to understand how the market works, you have to go through a harsh downturn. Right, not just a small little blip, you've got to go through a harsh downturn. And this is exactly what happens. So, on the uptick, as the market pulls out like it did in 2011, 2012, return profiles increase dramatically because there is a higher perceived risk as people are still thinking, uh, still fresh in their memory, the bloodshed of the downturn. Of the, of the recession, they, they want to compensate for that risk with higher returns. And as the cycle lengthens and it gets more and more heated and more liquidity comes into the market, returns start to compress. They get smaller and smaller as competition heats up as more money comes into the market. The key to your question was, what is a good deal right now? A good deal right now looks nothing like a good deal three months ago. What, what you have to deliver today, and this is just personal view, you have to deliver, a, there's a few components. One, you have to deliver outsized returns, period, because there's this massive sense of risk. You have to compensate for that sense of anxiety, that sense of risk that people have going into the market now. And you can do that, but it's not the same kind of deal that you were looking at three months ago. If you go and try and underwrite a, a, an apartment building or a retail center, for goodness sake, or a hotel to pick the most obvious, mm -hmm. you simply cannot underwrite against the same kind of assumptions that you had three months ago, right? Or even the beginning right. of March, not even, what are we, March, even two months ago, right? Before this thing really kicked in. The only way to deliver value today is to find opportunity, opportunistic investments. The key word is distressed real estate. I hate to say it, yeah. but I've been tracking the use of this term actually and this is how it works during in the when we're still in the very heart of a downturn the concept of when the when the downturn hits when the first waves of shock hit the economy as they did in 2008 actually or late 2000 well 2008 2009 the very beginning and the same now there is this kind of sense of panic. Everybody goes into fear mode, right? You don't know you're going to live, you're going to die, you're going to suffer some way physically, and you're going to be kicked out of your home in 2007. There's like this wave of fear. And demand for real estate just plummets, right? Everyone's on kind of this, this what the hell's going on mode. And the term distressed isn't used because it's tone deaf to the narrative that is pervasive in media and online and in the community, right? Very early on. Once there is a acclimatization to the circumstances and people become, it's a, slightly the wrong word because we are talking about disease here, but they become immune to the shock now. They become used to the shock greed, I'm sorry, fear becomes supplanted by greed again. 
And terms like distressed real estate can be used once more. And I've been tracking actually the use of this term uh, on Google since the very beginning and predicted that, that, it will con that the use of it will continue to rise. And as it continues to rise, what that means is there is more and more overt activity looking for distressed real estate. And I know this is very long, I'll stop talking now, but that's what you've got to find. In order to provide and to deliver value today, You've yep. got to find deals that have stories, and those stories typically are distressed stories. And and and, fo and just following up on that, how have you seen good, aggressive, thorough deal sponsors go after distressed real estate? I mean, are they going direct to seller? Are they going to the lenders? Are they looking for the the assets themselves? Are they looking at distressed notes? Um, what is a couple of strategies, or the best strategy in your opinion? Yes. Yeah, so again, the way that I got into it hardcore during the last downturn and I was living in LA, right? Massive city. Now I'm sitting in the middle of a field basically. So I can't do the same thing, but you can do it a lot. You can actually do it a lot easier because of the availability of information online today relative to what there was then. There's a few strategies that you can approach uh, that you can employ. Uh, one that I did, was to actually drive around. I actually took certain areas of the city of LA and systematically drove streets. I mean, really, I, just, I, I mapped it out and I drove around streets and I looked at the time for buildings under development because it was a little bit different then. But there are other signs that you could look for now uh, potentially that would indicate that a particular property was under distress. And you can do research online. Then what I did was I conducted title searches to see who the borrower had, uh, who the developer had borrowed from. And then I was able from that to be able to find out what their entire portfolio was. And then when I saw what banks they were borrowing from, I started to do research on who else those banks had been lending to and it's all public information right you can get into this with a title company or with various databases you can get to this and so what that did was it creates it creates a mosaic of of stress in the in the economy and then you can start to contact borrowers for example you could do like off-market deals some people they may not want early now like now people don't want they don't want anybody to know that they're, that they're divesting, right? You might find people that want to sell one asset, release some cash in order to shore up something else. So you look for patterns, people that aren't necessarily primarily real estate investors that have businesses that they need cash for, might be willing to sell deals or properties at discounts just to release cash. If you can turn it and it's cash of king, you've got to do it quickly. Uh, so that they can shore up another business. When it comes to notes, that is banks. And banks are notoriously difficult to uh, penetrate, actually. Uh, but uh, banks are slowly beginning to uh, identify assets, that loans that they have made that are beginning to reach um, what's called a, a point of no return. Now, point of no return for a bank is 90 days delinquency because after a note, after a loan becomes 90 days delinquent, it becomes a troubled asset. It's no longer, it can no longer be, um, gosh, what's the word? It can no longer be brought current. Now, even if the borrower walks in uh, it, on, on day 91 with everything that they owe, past payments, penalties, fees, etc., it's an irrevocably troubled loan. So it sits on the bank's books as a troubled loan, as a troubled asset, and the bank can either choose to hold on to it or sell it and get it off their books. So approaching local banks is, um, uh, uh, is probably not a bad idea if you can get in and talk to them. Okay, excellent. Clay, do you have any uh, other follow-up on that or should we shift gears a little bit and well, jump I into have, I, I have one that I think can, can kind of uh, parlay into what what we were, we were what we were going to talk about. Um, 
but I am glad that we talked about what a good deal is because uh, I think that's valuable. But you know, you, you mentioned something. You know, obviously that was some time ago. I'm curious. In today's world, you you said something that was interesting to me is that you've really been studying the term distressed. And my question is: Is there a way that you can digitally trace, um, you know, what certain people may be looking for from an online resource standpoint to find out if if there may be, be there there's maybe some pressure or distressed pressure uh, based on what they're looking for online? Have you studied that at all? Uh, well, you can't really you can't really see what any, you're talking about individuals. What individuals are looking. You can't see what individuals are researching online unless, you know, your Google or the NSA, <laughs> basically. Uh, all you can detect is trends uh, for per, uh, certain search terms. Interesting. You know, one thing, one thing that you might have, have you ever used uh, Google Alerts? Yes. Yeah, Google Alerts is, I find, a very powerful tool to run searches. You can run searches. If you're, if you're looking at a particular location and you want to run a series of keywords to get alerts, I, found, I find that is a very powerful tool to see something and then be able to jump on it quickly. So, you could, you know, you could, you could run search with the word notes, banks, and apartment, and, and, and maybe a, a location. And if something pops up, be the first one to make that call. Good. Good. Okay. Good little quick tip for the yep. current. So, yep. so, so, so going back, say we have a good deal. What's the next step? Right. So you uh, actually, <clears throat> well, actually just getting back to your original question. <laughs> uh, the next step is to tie it up and blah, blah, and all that kind of thing. But yep. what you're interested in is raising money. Right? That's right. what we want to talk about. Uh, so the other thing that you had said, interestingly, is that you had a hesitation investing with somebody online, right? It's like your confession. You know, I want to raise money online, but I'd never do it myself. <laughs> I'm not a sucker like that. <laughs> right, so this is, this is what happens, uh, uh, Clayton, seriously. That you, at the end of the day, you, you cannot raise $100,000 from anybody online. Nobody is going to send you a check like that without meeting you, without talking to you, without you actually converting them from being a prospect to being an investor. You do have to do that. It's what makes raising money for real estate fundamentally different than selling a $20 widget, right, it's online. And there's a lot of other things that go on. But a $20 widget or an information product like picking one wildly out of my ear, a LinkedIn course can, for example, go for all the way through the process from top of funnel, from first contact all the way through to sale without any personal contact, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's doable. Mm -hmm. But a $100,000 check isn't. What a digital marketing or content marketing strategy does for you, though, is that it changes, it, it predisposes prospects to want to invest with you before you actually have that content. And the reason for that is because the analog, all the digital, all digital marketing is doing is it is synthesizing what the analog world and the analog world is the one that you've already described where you meet a, you meet a local high net worth people, investors and RIAs and uh, doctors and lawyers and people that have a, you know, real job. Right? They're not developers <laughs> like us and they earn a living and uh, they want to invest in real estate. But you and I both know that that process is brain damage you've got to meet them for lunch and then at their time and then you've got to show up and print something out and hand it over and it's this whole dog and pony show of of uh, and this dance of uh relationship development trust me on one thing i like to say this trust me i'm a doctor right <laughs> uh, you don't want to do that because it's time consuming painful uh, and inconvenient, right? You've got your real job 
is finding good deals and executing on them, not raising money. But as painful as it is for you, trust me on this, it's painful for investors as well. And before the 2012 Jobs Act allowed it to happen this way, you had to meet them in person. You had to have a relationship. It, it, there was I'm also, you know, before technology allowed it. Now, I pull up my phone here. Now, everybody wants to consume information about you digitally. They want to use their phone. They don't want to meet you just as much as you don't want to meet them. They would rather hear your story, whatever it is, in their own time, in their own way, on the platform of their choosing whenever they want. When it comes to the conversion moment, <clears throat> when you actually say to them, this is why you've got to speak to Jillian, right? You've got to talk to your, you know, your attorney. Yeah. Uh, there comes a point where you actually say, I want you to invest. At that point, that's when you're going to have to talk to your client. I'm sorry, not to your client. You've got to talk to your prospect to carry them over the finish line to invest. But at that point, you will find they are far further advanced in the sales cycle than they would if you had developed that relationship in person. In the same way as when you get on the phone with me on this call, you know a lot about me. You know what I do. You know how I think. You've heard me talk, I don't know how many times. You've read my stuff. So we have a relationship. It's one way, but it's much easier. You can do the same thing and it's much easier to convert somebody when they've been through that process. Yeah. It's so exactly. you're creating this funnel, right? This massive funnel and you're, and you're doing it by creating content, valuable content. And uh, I've heard you use the term before, uh, uh, content compounding. Is that what you're first? Yes. <laughs> okay. And then you're, you're, you're using Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter to repurpose and recycle the same message to get it out in front of as many, many people as possible, driving them to some type of lead capture mechanism where you can continue to drip content on them, um, share upcoming potential opportunities um, and, and get them to a point of uh, a conversation or a decision where they can become an active investor. That's exactly right. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and what is that? What is that? So like, for example, the last deal we did, right? We used uh, four different groups, pursuit capital and earnest money was one group, equity, different group, uh, construction loan and construction debt, different group, loan guarantor, uh, different group. And talk about mo moving pieces. It's just so much stuff going on. It would be so much simpler if Clayton and I, for example, had a fund where as long as it met certain benchmarks, we could go and we could do the deal without any type of uh, additional investor conversations and execute because time is money. We want to be able to be opportunistic and we want to strike when the iron is hot. So when it, when it gets down to that time and we do tie up a deal, can you talk a little bit more about what that looks like and, and is that money available or is it is it it's not in escrow right do you have to go recircle back to the investors and, and say this is our deal would would you like to come in all right so you've asked a very important question it's uh, it, there's a <clears throat> i want to be clear first of all i told you right at the beginning the single most important thing is to have good deals well underwritten thoroughly underwritten that are compelling and risk mitigated. So let's be clear about that. The other thing that you have to have is you have to be able to demonstrate that you can actually execute on a business plan that typically is going to be reflected in your background and track record. You're asking about a fund. And yes, of course, as a developer, there is nothing more fantastical pulling from the word fantasy about having a fund, right? <laughs> to alliterate a little bit. Yeah. Of course, you would love to have a pool of cash sitting there that you can tap into at a moment's notice. 
But yes, I, that is my fantasy. Yes, it is extremely <laughs> difficult to raise okay. a fund. Okay. And the reason that it's extremely difficult to raise a fund, and you've touched on this already, actually you've defined why, perhaps without knowing it. And that is that you identified that you raise money based on some underlying investment thesis. And as long as that, as long as you find deals that fit with that thesis, you can use the money. Okay, so that's fine, but it adds an enormous barrier to your ability to raise capital because now, not only do you have to, in order, because now you have to explain, the first thing you've got to explain is the thesis, the investment thesis behind your fund. So let's just say for argument's sake, you're gonna say, we're looking for apartment buildings with over a hundred units that have this kind of delta to market rents that are of this particular era in this particular market, all right? So, okay, that's a valid thesis. The question is, all right, how do we know, how do I know as an investor that you can deliver, that first of all, well, that you, that you can deliver to that, show me all the deals that you've done that have gone full cycle to prove that you know what you're doing according to that thesis. And if you can't do that in a compelling way, you won't raise money for a fund. So what you have to do is to show people the DNA of an individual deal. And so what happens is that investors migrate towards, or, or gravitate, I should say, towards individual deals. Now there are some techniques that you can employ. And by the way, I the times that I've raised funds, money for funds, have been inside institutional entities where we had decades of massive scale uh, uh, investment experience and background as an entity and where the people we were raising funds from were pension funds and endowments who were writing 50 to $100 million checks. And the reason they were doing that was because they simply didn't have the bandwidth to look at every single deal. They, they couldn't do that. They had too much money to invest and they were looking for sponsors who were able to deploy large amounts of money based on a thesis that, uh, that, that fit into a particular risk return profile that fit their entire portfolio. When you're talking about smaller scale and individual investors, they don't have that same mentality. They do have the time to look at individual deals. And until you can prove that you're capable of doing something big and grandiose, you won't raise a fund. Now, having said that, there are some ways that you can create a little bit of leverage to get people into a fund before they go into individual deals. And the way that you can do that is that you can make it a condition of investing in an individual deal that a prospect or an investor is already invested in the fund. So you might say the pathway to investing in an individual deal is a $50,000 or $100,000 minimum in the fund. If you're in the fund, we, we will then open up the opportunity or first, first rights will go for individual investments in the individual deals only to people who are already invested in the fund. So that's one way that you can try to lever uh, prospect or investors through a fund into individual deals. But don't get me wrong, it's, I want to be really clear actually, it's extremely difficult to raise money for fund. Understood. So kind of kind of going back to what you said, and I, and I greatly appreciate you <clears throat> calling me out on my, my uh, resistance uh, from taking money online, but I think you made a great point, and I was sitting there listening to you talking, and I think, I, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I'd love to hear your opinion on this, but I think we're actually in a time period now where if people do try to do research on you and you don't have an online presence, it, it almost immediately throws up a red flag because um, I think people are so accustomed now to 
having that online data, if you will, or information on an individual. So, you know, what you're explaining to us and our audience is, is in my eyes, extremely valuable because what you're doing to your point is you're not necessarily asking for a check right up front. And I don't think that's the expectation either. The expectation is for you to establish credibility through an online presence. And I guess my question to you is understanding that now, um, and given that we have a limited amount of time here, my, my two questions is, what have you found through this new venture of you doing, you know, obviously digital marketing for raising capital? What qualifier, what, what, quali what qualifications are investors, uh, people that are looking to get into real estate deals, what are they typically looking for that, uh, that you think the, the individuals that are building this online platform can get the, the most bang for their buck? Meaning what, uh, what subjects can one talk about um, and you know, basically show that they're an expert in in order to create the most amount of credibility and also, I want you to talk, I know I'm talking a lot, so, but oh, I'd also good. like you to explain um, from, you know, one thing that I struggle with, doctor, is I, there's, there's so much noise out there of, of the best way to do something, right? From a technology standpoint, there's so many tools and some are great and some are not. And Gannon hears me complain about this a lot is, you know, there's, there's really not a one size fits all. There's so many. So can you give our, our listeners in, in the amount of time we have here left, what is the best way to really get started? What is the most effective way for someone to create an online presence and build that credibility with an audience out there? And I will, I will stop talking now. <laughs> <laughs> Great questions, Clay. I, I was building that up as you guys are having your You know, I'll tell you something. I have one of my, my, if I had a fault, which I don't, it would be my modesty. That's what my father likes to say. But no, one of my biggest faults is uh, verbosity. So don't worry about that. I'm more than happy to hear what you have to say. And doc, Dr. Gower, we may end up having to ask you on again because there's just so much ground to cover here. Uh, it, I just We can go down so many different rabbit holes on all this stuff. We, Your wealth information, um, those are great questions, Clay. And if we don't get everything covered today, uh, we may circle back around with you and ask you to come on again. That's very kind of you. Do you want me to hit these, uh, these three questions or this question yeah. that uh, Clay was asking? All right, so I'm gonna run through them quickly because we don't have much time. First of all, you talked about an online presence. If people can't find you online, this is what Brent Higelke told me during, this is his thesis, during uh, my podcast with him from CrowdStreet. He's their CMO at CrowdStreet. He said, if you don't have a presence online, you don't exist. Simple as that. So if somebody hears about you, go to all this effort, even if somebody makes an introduction for you, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to look you up on LinkedIn. They're going to look at your website. They want to know you. And if there's nothing there, they, good chance they will pass you by. If you have a good presence online, it helps move them through that relationship journey all the more. That's why you need a presence online. Secondly, the... Uh, Actually, this is what I was going to say. I was looking around while you were talking. I hope it wasn't a distraction. I was going to share this with you. I can't even see me now, actually. I'm going to try to do this quickly. You remember we used to use these. I'm showing off a bit because here's one of mine from Japan. <laughs> it's all in Japanese. Well, that's one of mine from Japan. I was trying to find my Universal Studios one yesterday. I've got it buried somewhere. I'm trying to dig it up. It used to be that you had to have a business card to kind of, you know, to... to to exchange, you had to have a business card. Then you had to have a website instead of a business card. Now you have to have a presence online. That does not just mean a website with a pretty picture and nothing else on it, all right? So that's the evolution. That's why having a digital presence is online. What is the most important thing? Another one of your questions. Clay, the simple what are people looking for? In one word, they are looking for authenticity. You are an expert in what you do. Just be authentic about that. I had a client approach me a few months ago that said, it comes from a very humble background and said, I want to have a private, I want to, everyone to 
think I want the, the image I want you to portray is private equity, like a downtown New York sky rise private equity shop. And I said, look, yeah, I could create that for you if you want that image, right? The whole look and everything of everything. I said, but I'm not prepared to do it. And if you want me to, if that's what you insist. I'm not taking you on as a client because at the end of the day, it's not real. It's not authentic. It's like, living your life in a movie, trying to act out your life instead of being who you really are. And it's authenticity. And actually, he's an incredibly impressive guy, right? this fellow, just because when you talk to him about his philosophy to investing, frankly, I think it's more compelling than private equity. So we, we just dug deep into his real, true self. That's what you want to bring out. That's what investors will invest in. If you've got any weak parts, points of your background, address those first and acknowledge them and articulate how it is that you are compensating for them, right? If you've not got background in this area, that we hire these people and these experts to compensate for that. And the, the last thing was how to get started. So you guys... Uh, the, the best way to get started, you have to start with content production. You build out your social media, right? Uh, that's a good place to start. LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook are key. YouTube as well, if you can. And then start putting high value content through that. And how do you do that? And this is something we didn't talk about. Content compounding. You take an interview like this or a podcast like this and you could create 20 pieces of content from this you could create articles you could create short videos excuse me you can create little quotes that end up as thumbnails and you rotate those through your social media on autopilot and if you're doing one of these i don't know how often you're doing it one a week then in 10 weeks you've got 200 pieces of content that are all circulating all pointing back to your website to a landing page that's how you that's how you get started okay. really, really that's, that's phenomenal and just yeah. just so our listeners know part of what you offer are services that help uh, 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 capital raisers to take on that task for them as a service correct that's right yes yeah. so we we build out these systems for clients for private clients so we right. do soup to nuts you go away go to the beach and we'll take care of it for you uh not that so you can great. go to the beach these days uh and then we also actually have so the entire system actually we that we build for clients for private clients uh, has been committed to a digital course of course because we're in the digital marketing era yeah. so the whole thing is in digital format and if you want to build one of these out yourselves or yourself, then you can buy that course and it really handholds you through the entire process from beginning to end. You can build out a content marketing platform. It's a lot of work. I don't want you to think that you set this thing up and money starts flooding in through the ceiling. It doesn't work like that. It requires commitment. You've got to have deal flow and you've got to put the work in. But the nice thing about content marketing is that when you, after, as soon as you produce your content, it becomes an asset. It doesn't go away. It's not time wasted. It's productive. It's like building a house that people come to. Once it's there, it's always there and it's always working for you. So it's, uh, it's, it's definitely worth doing. So my, so my, a couple questions, doctor, on this stuff, and this has come from me personally, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners are probably asking the same thing, but setting expectations, right? How long will it, how long does it typically take in your opinion to really build a presence to expect a return on your time that you're putting into this? You know, ballpark, I know this is a very broad answer, but I mean, what does it take to, to, to start up something like this? I mean, you, you know, I can't, you, you, you should be able to create something relatively compelling for not super expensive. It's more of a time commitment and then, so I want you to answer those two. And I want you to also answer, you know, is there tips that you have? Because, you know, we may have a lot of people listening to this show that are, that are experts in what they do. The struggle is always, you know, coming up with content 
and you know, obviously, you know, we listened to, to <laughs> Gary V and stuff, and he says, you know, don't don't think about that too much. More or less, just document what you're doing. But do you have some? T- I I want your opinion on that. So I'm thankful that you just did that, and I I, I want you to also uh, talk about yeah, just talk about is there a way to come up with content? Is there strategies that these guys can do listening to this program to structure content to help them move? Yeah through that kind of put together like a workout routine, if you will. Yeah. I'll tell you exactly what to do. Right. Uh, let's see. And, uh, how to create content or how to think about what content. Yep. Uh, so I'm taking notes cause I've got a memory of about a 30 second memory. <laughs> plan, uh, how to think, uh, how to, uh, uh, decide what content. Okay. So first of all, how long does it take? Well, it, the, to get up and running, effectively we figure about 90 days to have have the full system in place uh that is functional the system meaning the full funnel so that's top of funnel social media platforms all set up nicely links to your website ctas lead generation forms on your website auto responding email systems already integrated and basically your whole funnel in place the engine if you like uh, takes about 30, uh, 90 days from start to finish to get it done properly. Content production is the key. And I like to use this analogy. It's like building a car. Your website is the body of the car. Mm-hmm. You, get, you know, I think in your driveway, you've got a beautiful car out there and it's the body is your website. Great, but it's just the body of a car. You need an engine. And the engine is the technical uh, functionality right? The, the auto emailing, the auto social posting, the uh, CTAs, your lead gen forms, and the auto responses and everything that you've got, that's the engine, right? Uh, and that you can build both of those in about 90 days. But even if you've got a beautiful car in the driveway with a great body and a powerful engine, it's not going to go anywhere unless you've got fuel. And so you have, and the fuel in the digital space is your content. So when Gary V talks about just document what you're doing. Yeah, I've, tr- I've thought about that. I think nobody would have the slightest interest in what I putter about the bloody house doing or the thing like that. <laughs> the way to grab good content, I'll give you a, a, a really specific tip. This is straight out of the investor acquisition master course that we sell online and is the first thing that we do with private clients is you need to unwrap your DNA. And I'll give you a great way to do that. Take the latest pitch deck that you've got, or any pitch deck, one that you wrote 10 years ago. It doesn't really matter. As long as it's current for today, the same kind of deals. Right? Take your latest pitch deck and give it to somebody who has no clue at all about real estate. A nine-year-old child would be a good option right? A spouse who has no clue would be a great option, right? Anybody at all and have them underline for you all the terms in that, that they don't understand. And then take each one of those terms. And I'll I'll, I'll even give you a really good deep dive into this. This is how to get, we talked about SEO at the beginning. This is how to hack SEO and how to create content really well and know what you're going to be writing about. And trust me, if you do this, there's other ways to do it, by the way, it's all part of the course. You will have so much content ideas that you won't know where to stop. It will be hard stopping, but you take those concepts like cap rate, let's say cap rate, somebody writes, what's the heck's that underlines that term, then go on to Google, run a search just as they might, what is cap rate or what is a cap rate and then google will tell you what questions people are asking at the bottom of the page there's one thing people also ask this people ask that that will suggest some other search terms take those terms that google this is a hack seo hack so good yeah that google is asking put them into an outline and then sit in front of your computer just as you are now talking to me and teach somebody, answer all of those questions. That's wow, that is gold. It. it is gold. That's exactly how you do it. And I guarantee you, in one pitch deck, you probably get 20 or 30 terms that you've got to go through. 
And if you record it, now you can content compound. You can create articles from that, videos, you can create little thumbnails, and, and you can start rolling all of that out. What did you just do? You just laser focused on your personal value proposition because you took your pitch deck and you broke it down. So everything, by doing it this way, absolutely everything that you do is hyper-focused on what you do. And by answering the questions yourself, you are teaching your prospects who you are. You're demonstrating your authenticity. You're demonstrating your value proposition. And that's why this system works. Because at the point of conversion to investment, they already know you and they see the world through the lens of your experience. They know, like, and trust you and they want to invest. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And for our listeners, Dr. Gower, for, for those that want to learn more about you, we'll have it in the show notes, but while we have you here online, where can they read more and learn more about you and your, your company? Yeah. So the best place to go is gowercrowd.com. That's G-O-W-E-R, my last name, gowercrowd.com. That would be the best way. There's almost a half million words of content on that site. I just calculated it. It's a little this. search box there. You can find whatever you want. Well, I, I, mean, I think I've got all my questions answered. Do you have any last questions, Clayton? No, I, I mean, I was just going to say, I mean, I'm personally compelled at this. And I, and I really do think that this is, um, I think this is going to be a requirement uh, moving forward, if it not already is, um, in people, you know, having a relationship with you. I mean, just me personally talking, I think the first thing I do is, if I want to find more information out, you go to, you know, you go to Google and you research them to qualify if they know what they're talking about. <clears throat> and I think the other thing that comes across my mind where I think that what you're doing, Dr. Gower, is so powerful is, is this stuff could be very overwhelming. Um, it could be very daunting, uh, especially, you know, not, I'm a young guy, so I got to regulate myself a lot of the time, but a lot of the older gentlemen out there or the older ladies that are out there hustling, trying to put together deals and raise capital, getting this digital footprint, they understand that it's an important factor in the future and what they do, but they don't know where to start and how to get there and, and what your service is. And, and I'm, I'm pitching your service for you because I'm, I'm so compelled. With it, but what you really do is you're a coaching mechanism behind that. And you can also illuminate their path on how to really get going here and offer a service to where you can even you know, facilitate a lot of what you're talking about. So I think it's a, a, it's, a, it's a ridiculously awesome tool and a really good opportunity for a lot of people out there that's, you know, again, say, I'm really good at what I do. I, I understand the importance behind, behind having a digital presence, but I really need a service, a company to coach me and help me build this. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of babbling, but, but truly I think what you're offering is, is just extremely, extremely valuable. And I think a lot of our listeners will, will gain a ton of knowledge from this, but also, you know, I encourage all our listeners to, to please visit that website and engage with Dr. Gower, because I think this stuff really is gold. And I think, um, whether it's from a raising capital standpoint or it's building credibility as a broker developer, business owner, et cetera, this is something that you're going to benefit from. So um, we will absolutely put, you know, this information in the show notes. <clears throat> we'll put some, you know, uh, key videos that you've shared with us in the show notes as well that we think will be a, a huge benefit to our listeners. And I just thank you for being here. I think this is just great stuff. So thanks so much. It's really a pleasure. I'm really grateful that you asked me. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gower. Hope you have a great uh, day, great weekend, and we'll stay in touch. Lovely. Thanks a lot.